Um, good afternoon. My name is Ed McLaughlin. I'm going to talk a little bit about some changes uh, that we see happening in the retail environment. And um, I'll try to move through this fairly quickly in case you have questions at the end. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of a marketing concept because uh, I'm talking about retail and I want to apply, want you to think about applying this concept to retail. So it's pretty simple. There's, there's four quadrants and you've got a price high to low and you've got value added high to low. And when I say value added in this sense, I'm talking about everything that's not price. So it could be assortment and variety and ambiance and service and quality and all those things that aren't price. And then you put products in the space. So if it's a retailer, for example, is, is the product, you might have something that looks like this. So you have upmarket retailers in the northeastern quadrant. Why? Because they have high price, but you're willing to pay the high price because they add a lot of value. And down here you've got low-end retailers, and they don't have high prices because they don't offer you that much. And you've got conventional retailers in the middle who try to do a little bit of everything. So if you tried to place some retailers in your market into this perceptual space, and I've just picked some at random that are national, nationally known, it might look something like this. So you've got sort of discount retailers in one quadrant, you've got upscale retailers and conventional retailers sort of in the middle, and I just, I didn't do any research to place this, this is just an example. Although research can be very precise and very analytical in placing companies in these spaces. And then what's been happening lately is what I want to focus our attention on. So this was a picture a couple of years ago, but I think now what's happened is Walmart's gotten bigger and bigger. It became the largest company in the world, not the largest retailer, the largest company in the world in about 2003 or four, and has been increasing the gap uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and it's the retailer against which all other supermarket companies are positioning themselves in this space. 84% of all Americans shop at Walmart at least once a year. Even if they don't want to be Walmart, they can't ignore Walmart as a retail competitor. Um, you also see companies like Aldi expanding like crazy and moving a little bit more to the value added area. You see all the adding brands and adding services and adding uh, uh, sustainable, organic, value added kinds of products that they certainly didn't carry uh, 10 years ago. Um, you also see Lidl, the German uh, competitor slash counterpart to Aldi, uh, also entering the market uh, in the United States and we'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. Of course, the big deal if they vacate the space that they formerly were in is the opportunity that, cre that, that creates new white space for other competitors that come in below them on the price and val uh, less value added side, like dollar stores. Um, and then the big deal, of course, is this uh, 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 shockwave that was sent through the retail industry about six months ago when Amazon.com uh, acquired Whole Foods. So let's start and talk about each of those three disruptions, if you will. Discounters, continued dominance of Walmart, and in particular, I want to talk about the implications for the produce industry of those two trends along with the Amazon Whole Foods deal. First of all, we see dollars, uh, uh, discount stores growing in ways that we never expected them to uh, a few years ago. Consumer shifting, this started in 2008 recession, but it's continued uh, to the befuddlement of many in the retail industry to shift to, to value stores. No better example than looking at what's happened to the number and the position of dollar stores in the United States. So these are the two largest publicly held dollar stores. Uh, dollar General, Dollar Tree. Dollar General has got 13,300 uh, 13, stores. I remember when dollar stores entered the food industry environment in the United States about 25 years ago, and one of my colleagues, Chris Park, is sitting in the back row, and she's smiling, because we remember making fun of this new format. Oh, goody, another format. How long is this going to last? About a year? I mean, what can you sell for a dollar? 
Well, 25 years later, they've got 13,000 stores, and look at the next column. They added 1,000 new stores this year. I mean, do the arithmetic. That's three stores every single day of the year. 1,000 new managers of every store. It's kind of an amazing number. Uh, and family dollar, uh, that, uh, per, uh, that purchase dollar tree is, uh, uh, dollar tree that purchases family dollar, rather, is almost the same story. So um, not only an increase in this very low price oriented store, but you see the format of the store, and remember they started 25 years ago with no uh, food, uh, some uh, uh, cheap uh, lawn furniture, uh, party goods, paper products, and now, what happened? Now they're increasingly not only moving into food, that started 20 years ago, but the dollar stores started reasoning like Aldi, who also started with no, f with, uh, with no fresh food. They said, well, we got all these uh, 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 consumers, ladies, right here in the front row. We don't want you to stand. Come on. Um, we, uh, they, they said, well, we've already got these captive customers in the store. Let's, and we already know they're buying canned food. Let's add a little fresh food. Let's add some freezers. Let's add some coolers. In uh, 2017, 1, 000, uh, one third of the, the 1,000 new stores have fresh produce. They're starting to advertise fresh produce in dollar stores. Um, all the USA came to the United States 45 years ago, 600 products, no fresh food. Now, they're, and retailers laughed at them. What do you mean no fresh food? The Americans aren't going to buy this concept. No brands, no, no, no scanning, no bathrooms, no Coca-Cola. This can't work in the United States of America. Now they've got uh, $14 billion in sales in the United States uh, alone. This clicker is, um, oh, OK. With a positioning that, again, uh, 15 years ago, you couldn't have imagined Aldi with this positioning. With healthful foods, uh, yogurts, and, and sports drinks, uh, 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 not just hardware produce items, but items that are somewhat uh, challenging to handle in, in a company that um, I, I, until recently didn't carry brands at all. I love this quote from their CEO. Remember, this is a hard discount company. We're growing at a time when other retailers are struggling. We're giving our customers what they want, more organic produce, antibiotic-free meats, fresh, healthier options across the store, all at unmatched prices up to 50% lower than traditional grocery stores. I mean, that's an incredible business model if they can deliver uh, on, on that promise. Um, this is their growth. So they've got about... Uh, 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 1,300 stores today. They're projected in the next next couple of years to go to uh, 2,500 stores. That's 900 new stores in four years. If they achieve that, and by the way, not only are they on target to achieve that, they're a little bit ahead of their, of their projections. They'll be the third largest supermarket in the United States in terms of store numbers. Um, Chris, once again, was here when I took these photos in Australia. If you want to see a glimpse of what Aldi could become in the United States, take a look at their test marketing uh, in their newest market, which, which is very isolated from the rest of the world, so it's a perfectly uh, isolated, segregated test market, what they're doing in Australia. Um, beautiful signage, uh, a creative sort of quirky signage, a wine department in Aldi, Wines, even a wine snob would love. Switch and save. So Wald, uh, Aldi never carried branded products before. What are they doing now? They started in Australia, but they're doing it in all their new US stores with this new generation of stores we're talking about. They started carrying brands. Because they want to sell a lot of brands? No. Because they want to show you that Coca-Cola is $1.99 for two liters, and they've got two little facings of it. And right next to it, they've got Aldi brand cola for 69 cents. And those are the real prices. 
you say, whoa, Coke, one ninety nine, all the generic cola, sixty nine cents. Can I really tell the difference? And then they do that with all of the leading brands in the national brand category. So only Crest toothpaste, only Coca Cola, only uh, uh, Huggies uh, diapers, and so on. And by the way. <laughs> There's the Coca-Cola right there at the checkout. And lots of other things that you couldn't have, that are, that are on trend in terms of consumer interest these days. Um, uh, no artificial colors, gluten-free, all sorts of traceability uh, things that you couldn't have imagined in a store like Aldi even two or three years ago, to say nothing about five or 10. Um, and I'm sorry she's not here, but one of our students who's at this show is uh, uh, standing right there. This is the produce department. I mean, beautiful value-added products that are branded in Australia, a wood-paneled shelving, incredibly fresh uh, herbs. One of our students is holding those, these peppers. All the had a, 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 a history of carrying products in the produce area that were small, uh, sometimes number two, a little misshapen, not the highest quality. These are incredible uh, quality products. And uh, this is one of their newest stores in the U.S. Uh, with the same kinds of things. You see some, you see some um, ready pack uh, bistro bowls that are fairly high value in most conventional stores. You see Driscoll raspberries, uh, Chiquita bananas, Chiquita organic bananas in Aldi uh, at the same price as some of the local. But it's still Aldi. It's, it's kind of kind of a little dirty in the floors and, and out of stock in a few areas. So it, it, there's still a discount store, but a discount store with a different flavor. They compete in Europe head-to-head -head in all the major markets with Lidl. Lidl's uh, a, a format of one of the biggest supermarket companies in the world. Here's a, a store, a, a market we just visited a few months ago in the Netherlands, and Lidl and Aldi are right next to each other sharing the same parking lot. They do that all over Europe. Um, they're coming to the United States. Uh, they've got about uh, 25 stores open now on the east coast of the United States. They say they're going to have about 100 stores by the end of this year. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, they've discontinued uh, some of the sites in a few states like New Jersey and Pennsylvania, indicating that maybe they're having a little bit of trouble uh, uh, customizing to the U.S. market. Uh, that shouldn't surprise us. It's a brand new market for them. Leo is not a public company. Leo can stay here as long as they want. It's not like Fresh and Easy with Tesco, whose shareholders were saying, you guys are bleeding money, you gotta pull out of this and it's gonna affect our stock price. Leo family can stay here as long as they want until they get it right, and I, I, I think they probably will. Um, I neglected to mention, well, I won't even mention it. Um, here you see uh, one of the stores in Holland, and they're doing this in the United States, uh, Scratch Bakery. Uh, in the store of a hard discount operation, highest quality fruits and vegetables, this sign says in Dutch, uh, in the country, rainforest bananas. Again, not the kinds of attributes you expect to find in products of a discount uh, supermarket. There we go. Uh, one of the new stores in New Jersey, they're doing the same kinds of things. They're, they're featuring not just the canned goods and not just the broken down cereal boxes, but fresh produce and some pretty interesting, uh, just little merchandising information about how to use new products of the summer, blueberries and so on. Um, uh, Walmart, another disruption. Walmart's not a new deal. Uh, it's been in, uh, around for uh, 55 or so years. It's been in the food business for almost 30 years. So uh, what's there to say, again, about Walmart that hasn't already been said? Well, I will say, <laughs> this thing's driving me nuts. There we go. Um, I will say that Walmart has been having some struggles uh, recently. So this is number of new super centers. So Walmart's got a lot of formats, but the super center is the, the sort of the driver, the engine uh, of its uh, of food sales. And uh, that other uh, axis says number of new store openings. So this is the number of new store openings uh, until about 2007. And since 2007, you see what's happening to new store openings. Is that because Walmart is doing so poorly? Well, not necessarily, but the market is starting to get saturated with Walmarts. 
there's not the opportunity for new, uh, you guys okay? For new Walmarts like there once was. Uh, the, the, the little shaded columns you can barely see is the total number of super centers. So it went from zero in 1990 and it's growing to see, uh, you've got, to, today you've got about almost 4,000 uh, super centers just in the United States. So the, the growth is slowed and they're not opening as many super centers. Maybe that's not great news. Walmart stock, some of you came in late and I said a minute ago that Walmart became the largest company in the world in about 2003. They, they surpassed ExxonMobil and they've just been widening the gap since then. Their stock price in 1999 was about 70, 68 to 72 in that era, in that era bounced around for a year or two. Between 1999 and 2013 or 14, Walmart went from about, I'm going to guess at this, about $150 billion in sales to $400 billion in sales. So they added, they added over a trillion dollars of incremental sales and about $60 billion of incremental profit. Their stock price went from 70 to 48. What? Why? Why? This is why. This is uh, sales growth in 2002 to 2008. So this is a company that was, you know, roughly $200 billion that's growing at double digits. How can that happen? But it didn't last for long. And by the way, in the 90s, they were growing, they were growing in the 20s. They, they were growing by a, a 30 and 40% a year, even though they're a $100 billion company. Kind of an amazing story. But that slowed, that slowed down in recent years, and stockholders became to expect this kind of double-digit growth. So even though they were growing sales larger than any other company in the world, they were actually losing value, losing ca capitalization, and certainly losing uh, a lot of stock price. Um, now, that's sort of the bad news. This is same store sales, arguably the most important metric uh, analyzed by investment banks for retail firms. This is, a, this is a, a measure of cash management effectiveness. In other words, how much sales incremental do I, gotta, do I get out of each store compared to what I got out of it last year? And it would be nice if that was a positive number. In other words, with the same asset base, I'm getting more profit and more sales than I was a year ago. Starting around 2000, and you can see how it's bounced around, but starting in Q4 2014, Walmart has had, whatever that is, 15 or 16 quarters of very nice same-store sales growth. And uh, in particular, if a retailer hits 1%, they're doing pretty well. Most retailers are happy with that. In the last six or eight quarters, Walmart uh, has been well above that. In fact, the quarter they just reported a couple of weeks ago, they were 2.6%. So they're moving into an era where the same store sales is really doing pretty well. We used to say there's no such thing as a national supermarket in the United States because they were all regionally based. It's kind of hard to argue. And again, this is just super center format. It's not Sam's, it's not neighborhood stores. It's hard to argue that Walmart doesn't have a national footprint in the food business today. This is the total sales, largest company in the world. See that number up there? They're a little less than 600 billion. 600 billion. How big is that? It's kind of hard to, it's like how far is it to the moon? I, I don't quite understand how many miles that can be. Um, to put it in a little perspective, this is the next three largest retailers in the world next to Walmart. So you see Costco's number two, Kroger's three, Carrefour's four. Big companies, sophisticated companies, all doing quite well. Kroger's had a few hiccups, but they've been doing, they, the last two quarters have been pretty well. And that's, that's how they compare to Walmart. So it's kind of hard to not figure Walmart's strategy as they've moved back toward low price strategy. That, that stock price decline had a lot to do uh, in the, uh, 
uh, in, in the 2000s with, with losing their, taking their eye off the ball of low price all the time. And I, won't, I don't have time to talk about what they did do, but they're, they're moving back toward more of a price-focused idea. Um, going forward, this is interesting for Walmart, return to always the lowest price. That's what I was saying. Formerly, they were 20% above Aldi. Now, in some markets, because of the billions of dollars they're investing into pricing, they're now lower in some cases. This is an important takeaway from whatever I have to say today. Suppliers are under a lot of pressure today from the discounters and from Amazon both. I'll talk about Amazon next. Walmart has told their suppliers this. You guys, you suppliers, are expected to help us beat our rivals, your rival uh, uh, suppliers, by 15%, 80% of the time. You understand that? You've got to help us beat our rivals in price by 15%, 80% of the time. Now, if you're a supplier at Walmart, they're already your biggest customer. And you're already doing your best job to give them the lowest price. They're your biggest customer. How can you lose Walmart? Now you've got to do, on top of what you were ever doing before, and that's another seminar. And Walmart is investing. Walmart hates being number two to Amazon. Walmart is by far number two with Amazon.com in e-commerce. They hate it. And they're investing big time. They paid $3.1 billion, billion, for Jet.com. And that's starting, and that now that's being integrated now with Walmart.com. And uh, you can expect a lot of things from that. Um, last disruption, e-commerce. So major study from AC Nielsen, uh, introduced at the FMI midwinter meeting earlier this year. Uh, said the following, and this got this this uh, uh, estimate has been taken uh, by uh, many in the industry who know about this and who study this as pretty accurate and maybe even conservative. They say by 2025, the share of online grocery could be 20% of total grocery, meaning about a billion, a hundred billion dollars, or the equivalent of 3,900 grocery stores, or 40% of the center store volume the non-perishable kind of volume. That's a major disruption. When you consider that most retailers don't own their stores, they lease their stores. And they lease them for 10 years, 20 years. Some stores have 30 year leases. Now you got a store that's 60,000 or 80,000 or 100,000, doesn't matter, square feet. You got a 30 year lease requirement and there's nothing going on in the center of the store. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but center of the store is where the penetration is going to e-commerce more than fresh. It's starting in fresh. I don't think fresh is insulated by any means, but this is a major concern. If retailers lose 10% of their sales, I have no question that consumers aren't going to flock to e-commerce and leave bricks and mortar stores by the wayside. There's no way they're going to do that. Not even. The majority are always going to use, for, our, for our, our foreseeable future, bricks and mortar stores. But, if bricks, but already e-commerce is 4, 5, 6% of total sale, uh, food sales. If it grows to 10% or 15% in certain markets, because 5% is the national average. So if it's 10%, if it's 5% in your market, it might be 15% in your market. If retailers lose 10% of their top line, that pretty much wipes out the whole bottom line. 10 to 12% top line erosion would pretty much wipe out the whole bottom line and lots of retail, not, a, not for every store, but for many stores in a chain would have to close. Then this happens. June 16th, uh, almost six months ago, Amazon announces this deal, $13.7 billion. Uh, they buy Whole Foods. Uh, and this is the background. So we said supermarkets are being assaulted by discount stores. That means Walmart and dollar stores and all the rest. Uh, national brands losing share uh, all over the country to private label. I can show you those trends, but take my word for it. Whole food sales health is questionable. I'll show you that in just a minute. Whole Foods was thrown a very important lifeline by Amazon. Uh, they needed a big time. 
their stock price was declining, uh, same store sales were a, a nightmare, and they had some active uh, investors uh, in their hedge funds calling for major changes uh, in, in, uh, in Whole Foods. And this is what the stock performance uh, looked like. So the top performance is Amazon. So you see about five years ago, Amazon stock price was about 200. Uh, I just checked before we came in here this, uh, today, about 11.30 today. Any, anybody know what Amazon stock price is? So this is, this is halfway through 2017, it was about 1,000. Right this morning, it closed, it, it wasn't it hasn't closed for the day yet, but this morning it was trading at, at, at 11.57. So in five years, it's gone from 200 to 11.57. In the meantime, Whole Foods has gone from about 55, in fact their peak was almost 70, uh, today it's a little below 40. Amazon stock exploding, well, Whole Foods stock is falling to the floor, and for various reasons, one needed the other. It was a marriage that no one saw coming, but they both needed desperately. Amazon sales 136B, is the global innovation machine that you know, uh, focusing on technology, uh, uh, pricing, to, pricing uh, to the bottom like there's no tomorrow. And here's the thing behind the deal. The largest single sector, economic sector, in almost any developed country is the food business. Uh, in the United States, it's about a trillion, it's a little over a trillion. You add supermarkets and food service together. Amazon wasn't in that sector. They were in all the other sectors of the economy except that they had to be in that sector. So they started with Amazon Fresh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, but they hadn't really penetrated the food business and they knew they needed to. Um, this is not gonna be easy for Amazon, by the way. Uh, if, if they change Whole Foods that was hurting to death too much, then they ruin the good part of what everyone loved about Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck. If they don't change enough, about to Whole Foods, then they don't fix all the efficiencies that are causing the poor performance. So it's gonna be a little bit of a high wire act for Amazon.com. Think about the innovations introduced by this company, by Amazon, in the last 15 years. So about 15 years ago, they said, hey, we're pretty good at selling books uh, online, but how about food? It's the biggest sector in the economy, after all, we, we should try it. So they started selling dry stuff online. And it started growing. I don't, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, uh, erupt overnight. But they know how to ship cardboard boxes of Cheerios the same way they can ship cardboard boxes of books. So they can ship dry groceries around the country and you understand how that can happen. Um, and then they soon realized if we're going to do that, why don't we introduce an innovation on that called sub subscribe and save. And this is, this didn't grow rapidly in initial years, but what they've been able to do is, once you're on Amazon and you're ordering toothpaste, Amazon's got algorithms that can predict how much and how frequently your family uses toothpaste better than you can. Same with other kinds of hardware goods like shampoo and maybe cereal and sauces and so on. So they tell you, look, you need Colgate toothpaste every six weeks. So don't even worry about it. We'll just send you one every six weeks. You sign up for the subscribe and save program. And you can do that now with any product. It's starting to grow rapidly with the new uh, algorithms, especially if you're an Amazon Prime member. I'll talk about that in a minute. They then introduced, yeah, but groceries maybe isn't the place where consumers want to be. We want to be in fresh food. So four or five years ago, they introduced without much fanfare, Amazon Fresh. And the idea was you can go on, you can, you can purchase uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, and uh, uh, you know, they offer blueberries and raspberries and so on. You say, wait a minute, am I gonna buy raspberries online? Are, are you kidding? Well, they have the quality chart in radishes. So they say, our produce specialists have high standards. They take seriously the responsibility of reading fruits and vegetables you'll be feeding your family. Each day, they carefully review and rate each item. Ratings are refreshed every afternoon to give you a blah, blah, blah. So your product can be five, a five radish deal, never better makes our produce specialists say wow. Or you can be only four radishes, 
above average, looks and tastes great. Three radishes and so on, down to one radish. Not impressive, but available in case you need it. So here we have some three radish deals. Okay. Then you see some other products, organic strawberries. Over there you see peaches. One radish. Maybe they're making peach pies. I don't know what they're doing, but so but you gotta you gotta give them credit for transparency. And look, they said the peaches aren't very good, so it's your fault if you want to buy them. I mean, they're, they're honest about that. The thing I love, another thing I love about this, you search for you search for berries the way I did in this thing, and you get all these other berry products, including chuckberry. Okay. <laughs> 